five, five unmatched. But you know, I'm interested in it because it's got a picture of a penguin. 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 I'm excited about this product because Risk V represents kind of a possible upheaval, a disruption, a disruption from below and possibly in the future a disruption from above. Um, Linux itself was kind of that. In, <laughs> in the era in which Linux was born, there were pretty much nothing but proprietary operating systems and toy educational operating systems. And now Linux has completely taken over the universe. I think that's the hope and the dream of the team behind RISC-V. So this is an implementation of RISC-V. This is a four core system on chip. This is the upgrade over the board that I reviewed previously, but with one important distinction, one important twist. This board is ITX. High five unmatched. This is what you get in the box. Please read before using this product. This is not a product for mass consumption. This is a product for people who are very special. People who are gifted uh, code weavers, if you will. Oh, would you look at that? It comes with a micro SD card. I came prepared with my own and it's even the same brand. We think alike. Look at this rear IO shield. We have a little micro SD label. Oh, it's so cute. The other accessories here are some uh, standoff mounts and your M.2 accessories, because this thing has two M.2 ports, one for a Wi-Fi card and one for uh, M.2 storage. So this is the dev board that you can pick up for around $1,000. This gives you PCI Express connectivity, 16 gigabytes of memory, you get the optional real-time clock backup battery in the corner here, which is not included because, well, when they did regulations for lithium ion batteries, regular lithium batteries got swept up in that. These batteries that have been around for 35 years and are insanely not dangerous and will definitely not catch an airplane on fire are no longer, you know, you still have to put special labeling on it if this kind of lithium battery is present because of international regulations. When really they intended to just target the lithium ion batteries, those are the ones, that, the cheap ones that can't wait to catch on fire. But uh, yeah, this is, it's a story for another day. We have a standard 24 pin ATX power connector, but no other power connectors because this board <laughs> running full tilt is only gonna consume about 50 watts at most. This board, like its predecessor, is aimed at developers and programmers who want to sort of kick the tires of the platform. This is pretty nice because Sci-5, you know, the folks behind Risk v uh, are sort of putting their money where their mouth is. They're, they're trying to do this development board um, as accessibly as possible for developers. And if you have a product that you want to be cross-platform compatible, Around $1,000 is pretty reasonable for a dev kit for something as powerful as Risk v I mean, you can do custom silicon with 90-day turnarounds if you're interested in having something custom built, which of course is gonna be many orders of magnitude more expensive than that. But this gives you access to the Risk v platform. If you're doing embedded development, you're building some kind of a, you know, a network widget, you're building a new NAS or a SAN or whatever, and you've been eyeing the Raspberry Pi, uh, you know, things where typically ARM or MIPS or something like that um, would make sense, you might be eyeing something like Risk v it's probably the case that if you look around at MIPS and some of the other embedded non-ARM architectures and you look at the tool chain, like the developer side of it, if you're a programmer and you've adopted a lot of really new cool stuff in programming, things like stack smashing protection and you know address space layout randomization and things like that, you've probably found your tool chain completely lacking on basically everything except ARM the last five or 10 years. Um, a lot of people have been suffering under that paradigm. It's really not a great situation to be doing embedded programming because the focus is on security because we've had things like, you know, your baby monitor at your nanny's house down the street is uh, DDoSing a hospital in Kiev. Sort of unacceptable in the modern world. It's a bit of a faux pas uh, if you're running insecure IoT things. And in no small part of that, it's because of poor software development practices. And uh, poor software development practices also spill over into hardware design. So, you know, lessons learned from one architecture don't necessarily spill over into the other. Well, Risk v kind of aims to change all that uh, directly and indirectly because it's a modern 
tool chain. It's a nice tool chain to work on. Uh, it's, a, it's a featureful platform whenever you're gonna have to do some of those porting operations to port it from some arbitrary embedded system to this. Uh, Western Digital, pretty famously, is a huge supporter of uh, RISC-V initiatives in general and is already using it in their products. NVIDIA also has RISC-V in some of their products. Pretty much all the big names that have licensed ARM or other architectures for embedded systems are looking at RISC-V and saying, this is where we need to be. So these companies can still invest and develop their own uh, you know, proprietary uh, you know, intellectual property, but they can offer that intellectual property a la carte to customers that they may not even really be aware of through the initiatives that Sci-5 and others are doing with the RISC-V platform. It's sort of a fun you know, uh, smorgasbord, I guess, of hardware design and intellectual property. You could cherry pick RAM controllers and, and interface IO and analog to digital converters and have custom silicon produced to solve your exact problem, but while still having a relatively robust and standardized software platform so that you get the benefit of all the tools that have things like address space layout randomization and a good memory allocator and you know efficient bytecode you know, mapping and that kind of thing. There's a lot to like philosophically and organizationally for RISC-V. They're not out to uh, take over the universe by having superior intellectual property, you know, the best product, everybody has no choice but to use it. They're out to just be usable and a reasonable basis for things, which kind of reminds me of Linux again. So this, this motherboard, ITX, ITX layout. Let's do a build. This is the Dr. Zaber Sentry. This is pretty much the perfect case for this because this thing doesn't get hot, it doesn't run really hot, it's completely fine. We don't even have to have a real power supply. Like a 400 watt power supply for this is gonna be extreme maximum overkill. This is the only time I will ever recommend a Diablo Tech power supply. Oh man, if only Gamers Nexus was around when Diablo Tech was, you know, the thing that everybody would buy really cheaply because, oh boy, they haven't seen anything until they've seen a Diablo Tech power supply fail. Uh, you old timers, you old timers in the comments, you know what I'm talking about. Yeah, yeah, oh, that's fine. We're gonna go from zero to Debian workstation on this thing with Wi-Fi. I'm even gonna add a Wi-Fi adapter. It doesn't come with a Wi-Fi adapter. You get the little, little M.2 and the cutouts for the antenna, but we're gonna add Wi-Fi. Or at least we're gonna try to. I don't know about the binary blobs loading on RISC-V, but eh, we'll roll with the punches. We'll see what happens. Could have been the little tabs up out of the way. Oh, no USB front panel header. Shucks. On board, we do have four five gigabit USB three ports and a gigabit Ethernet NIC, a uh, USB debug console. It's a serial console, basically and our micro SD slot. We do also have a single three pin fan header on this motherboard. Now this motherboard does have a single X16 physical slot. However, looks can be deceiving. That is only by eight electrical. Of course, on a system like this, that's not even remotely gonna bottleneck. Now getting set up and running with your RISC-V system is a little tricky. It's not like there's a BIOS where you can go in and configure options and tell it that you wanna boot from USB and do the traditional installer. Uh, Canonical has actually put a lot of work into making Ubuntu available for both the Hi5 Unleashed, the original RISC-V board, and Hi5 Unmatched, what we have in our Dr. Zaber mini PC right now. I've added the GPU, I've got everything up and running. There's a step-by-step -step guide on the Level 1 forum, but to walk you through it really quickly, this motherboard basically is designed to boot from micro SD. It comes with a micro SD card because it is a little tricky, and I think a lot of people would think their board was DOA if they didn't have that pre-configured micro SD bootable image. There is a dip switch on the board to be sure to configure some boot options. I don't really want to get into that for this video. The easiest way out if you're adding NVMe storage like I did because NVMe is a heck of a lot faster than that micro SD card is to uh, use DD or if you're on Windows uh, Belina Etcher to etch the Ubuntu image. It's a pre-installed image so you don't even have an installer really. It's just a, a disk image that's ready to go um, to use that to image the micro SD card. And then once you image the micro SD card, you boot off of the micro SD card, download the image again, and decompress it 
to the NVMe so that your boot drive is still on the micro SD, but slash and optionally your home directory are mounted off of the NVMe. That's what I've done. Now you'll find the repositories a little bit lacking. Uh, things like installing Firefox did not work for me properly on this platform. Even the mouse cursor is a little bit knackered. It'll uh, show up mostly correctly when you're in an application, but when you're hovering on the desktop, it just shows up kind of as a square. You can uh, install the graphical environment sort of as a second step once you've got the image set up. But I did manage to install, um, I did manage to install web, the GNOME GTK web browser, uh, but it was basically unusably sluggish on my machine. I'm not really sure why, uh, because everything else was actually surprisingly snappy. Um, using other applications. I think I can probably compile Firefox on my own, but it's gonna take a little while. I could cross compile, but I don't really wanna get into that. But the other thing that I was interested in was games and how's game performance. Now, even though AMD GPU is open source, there are some binary blobs that go with that. Those are loaded under the GPU, fortunately, so they're not architecture specific. And I'm happy to report that doing testing with my ASRock Phantom Gaming GPUs that I have on hand, everything from an RX 580 to the 6600 XT that they sent me, uh, everything worked fine. Is he crazy enough to install a 6900 XT in a RISC-V system? This is the OC formula. Yes, it does work, but you're gonna have to wait for a future video on that because the 3D acceleration, they're still working on that. Just because you got AMD GPU doesn't mean that you have Mesa and everything else. Yes, yes, it does work, but you know, it's PCI Express by eight on this platform, and we're talking about four relatively anemic risk cores. I mean, a Raspberry Pi is a better user experience at this point, but it is incredible how far Risk Five has come in just a few short years. This is a perfectly usable, you know, relatively low end desktop experience. If you're somebody who's interested in porting your drivers to Risk Five or having a little bit more, you know, hands on experience with Risk Five, I found this to be a perfectly usable uh, development environment. I actually looked at Doom 3 because the full sources for the Doom 3 engine are available and I bought Doom 3. So I was able to look at the source code and see what sort of changes were required for Risk 5. Spoiler, nothing. If you have the source, basically everything compiles and works fine. This is really an ideal situation. And I'm definitely not the first to do this and get this up and running. I think the first was probably Rene Rebe, R-E-B-E. -E. You can check him out. He's streamed a lot of stuff to YouTube. Actual developer working on actual developer things, not just, <laughs> not just some internet computer janitor bozo. Actually doing really useful stuff. You should check out his streams and other stuff like that if you're interested in RISC-V and some of the stuff that's required for forward movement on RISC-V. I know that I've been following that because I'm interested in this platform and where it could go. Is x86 at a dead end? Is ARM gonna take over? Well, just about the time that ARM builds up enough inertia to take over, RISC-V comes in from behind. I don't know. I don't know what the play-by-play -play is gonna be, but I do like keeping an eye on new platforms and things that could change. Other gaming, Quake 3 Arena worked fine. Doom 3. It's perfectly reasonable, pleasant experience. So 3D acceleration, 3D acceleration available in the context of web browsers because believe it or not, those actually do use a lot of graphics acceleration. All of the moving parts for this platform are basically here. Now it's up to the developers, up to the developers to carry it forward. Will the inertia of x86 win out or will RISC-V rule the day? Well, you can stay tuned to level one, figure that out.